perfect, perfect. I'm gonna figure out how to make the zoom a bit smaller so I can see it. Okay, here we go. Well, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for logging on today, uh, this morning, afternoon, evening, where, wherever it is where you are. Uh, bit of a wild market today, but glad we could still uh, have some time to, to talk about these ideas, which is uh, a lot of fun. So what is a strange little company called Butler National Corporation. And before I get into it, I'll say that if you don't know me, my name is Dave Waters. Uh, I am the president of Alluvial Capital Management. Uh, you can check out my website and my management company at alluvialcapital.com. I'm pretty active on Twitter. My handle was Alluvial Capital. And for email, it's just info at Alluvial Capital. And I'm always happy to talk ideas or, or anything. So uh, if I don't know you, love, would love to get introduced. Uh, let's talk. So on to Butler National. And I also have to say that I do own shares of this company. So I'm absolutely talking my book here, do your own research, all that jazz. Okay, Butler uh, trades in over the counter in the US and under the ticker BUKS Bucks, uh, has 74.18 million shares outstanding. Uh, the recent bid ask is 57 and a half cents by 60 cents. So at 60 cents, the market cap is 44.5 million. Uh, has 18.2 million in cash on the books, total data of 46.9 million and net debt of 28.7 million. But you'll see in a little bit that most of that debt is affiliated with a particular segment. Moving on, uh, and what does the company actually do? Uh, as I said, this is a strange, strange company that has two almost completely unrelated segments, uh, both of which are profitable, both of which contribute to the company's value, but have absolutely no synergies and really don't belong together at all. Uh, the first segment the company owns is the Butler Hill National Services Corp Service Corporation, which owns uh, a casino in Western Kansas, uh, in Dodge City, Kansas, which is a sort of legendary cowboy shoot 'em up town from the Wild West days. Now is just sort of a agricultural, very, very remote uh, location in Western Kansas. But they have this casino there. They have had it for, for a couple of decades and they own it and operate it under a long-term agreement. And so it's, it's a cash cow. Uh, they also have an aerospace division. Uh, in aerospace, they have Avcon Industries and Butler Avionics. Uh, and these provide uh, FAA approved uh, modifications, upgrades, uh, any kind of work you need to have done mostly on a personal aircraft, a small aircraft. Not We're not talking... Uh, private jets. We're talking literally personal aircraft, Cessnas and things like that, four to six seaters. If you have a, a need for any kind of work on your, on your airplane, you can take it to them and, and they'll do it for you. Uh, and they also do some defense work as well. And the company is headquartered in uh, Olathe, I believe it's pronounced, Kansas, which is in eastern Kansas, not too far outside of Kansas City. Okay, so like I said, the two different businesses, but the company had the misfortune of both of these businesses being in perhaps the, the worst affected industries uh, by the COVID crisis. Uh, obviously, when, when COVID swept the country, they had to close the casino in March uh, of last year, and it remained completely closed uh, for a period of several months, after which it had a limited reopening. And it's just now getting closer to being fully reopened, even though it's not there yet. Uh, aerospace, of course, also was tremendously impacted by, by COVID and they experienced a large decline in, in orders, but, but those are now recovering as well. So let's take a look at each individual segment and then start talking about what they might be worth. Uh, Boot Hill Casino and Resort, as you can see, is, is somewhat of a modest structure. Uh, definitely not anything you'd see on the Vegas Strip or, or anywhere else, but at the same time, it's not got a lot of competition. There's not a whole lot uh, to do in the way of entertainment and the way someone from a larger city might think of it in, in Dodge City, Kansas, but they do have the casino, which seems popular and has reasonably good reviews on TripAdvisor and places like that. I've never been. Uh, if I'm ever in the area, I'll, I'll stop by. But this is one of only four uh, non-Native American owned and operated casinos in Kansas. Uh, and uh, Butler operates under a long-term license, which was just renewed and stretches out to 2039. So they'll, they'll run this casino for, uh, for another generation. 
Uh, the economics, Butler owns 80% uh, of this subsidiary, but has only a 60% economic share. They split the economics 60-40 with their minority partner. And they've been looking into buying out the, the minority interest in this segment for, for quite some time. And they've had sort of friendly negotiations, but as, as of now, it's, it's yet to occur. Uh, there we go. Yeah, so let's look at the historical results of, of the I excluded fiscal 20 because obviously those results were, well, at least we hope so, given the uh, coronavirus pandemic. But historically, the casino is about as steady as steady comes. Uh, they typically earn, um, you know, anywhere between 30 and 32 million in revenue. Uh, the cost uh, of that revenue is fairly steady based on the defined split they have with the, with the state. And, uh, and so is the gross profit. Uh, below there, they have operating expenses, which tend to run, but you know, in the in the ten million dollar range, and uh, on a pre-tax basis, they earn between one and a half and getting up toward two million, not quite getting there. Uh, and so, yeah, it's like I said, it's a steady business. It's a cash cow. Uh, it, it they kind of make money year in year out. Uh, they do a, a bit better when the economy is 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 hot and, and uh, beef prices are high, and they do a bit worse when when things are slow but uh, they are consistently profitable. However, there's good reason to think that these profits can be a lot better going forward, and I'll get into that as well. Uh, let's see, yeah, so, but just like I said, the, the long-term performance drivers of the casino segment, well, some people say, well, you know, what happens if, uh, if online gambling and sports betting becomes a lot more popular because this is getting a lot more popular in the US, just recently legalized nationwide. I think that's less of an issue for, for Butler because they, they are in this deeply, deeply rural area. With a lot of their customers are, are older and go to the, the casino for the social aspect as much as the, the gambling. And they, their tendency, their preferences run towards slot machines over, uh, over sports betting. Uh, like I said, they have this long-term agreement and it's very likely that it'll be extended in, indefinitely. But it's always possible that the state government decides they need a, a larger percent of revenue. Um, it, politically speaking, it's, it's always pretty easy to lean a bit harder on the casinos to raise revenue uh, compared to other sources uh, of tax. Uh, there's also a well, little typo here, but uh, additional competition could always come in. Uh, Native American tribes are always free to build their own casinos and operate those in their land. And it's always possible that the state government could approve additional casinos uh, again, in search of additional tax revenue. Um, catalysts coming up. Uh, the major, major thing here is for a long, long time, Butler leased its casino from another owner, but they actually went out and bought it uh, in December of last year. Uh, the previous uh, annual lease payment was 4.8 million with a small inflation escalator every year. Uh, but having uh, financed the casino purchase at a pretty decent rate, uh, the cash costs of ownership are, are going to decrease uh, substantially, which would increase their cash flow. Uh, also, there's a, there's a recovery going on in, uh, in the casino profits. Uh, you can actually check out the monthly casino revenues for Boot Hill just by going to the State of Kansas uh, Gaming uh, Commission website. And you can see that uh, for all this time, up until just a month ago, revenues were still lagging behind the previous highs hit in 2019. But for the state of, for the month of March, uh, revenues were up about 5% over those previous highs in 2019. So revenues have fully recovered and are actually hitting new highs at the casino. And this is probably driven by a couple things. Number one, just people eager to get back to the casino after so long, and also the stimulus payments that the government has made to individuals. Uh, some of that will, of course, end up in, in the slot machines. But there's good reason to believe that the future uh, looks pretty good for, for the casino. Uh, and as far as the valuation estimate, I, uh, I won't go too far into this given time constraints, but I have uh, the 2019 results uh, statutory, and this is fiscal 2019 here on the left. And I adjusted that for the impact of the, uh, of the casino purchase, backing out the lease cost and instead using the mortgage interest and the depreciation figure that the company will likely report, as well as the maintenance capex figure, which I think is conservative at about 2% of the building value per year. And you can see that after taking out the minority interest, we get about one and a half million in, uh, 
in tax and in post-tax income for, for Butler, which I valued at about a 10% free cash flow uh, multiple. Um, I also used a 2021 projection, assuming about 5% revenue growth uh, and what that might look like. And, and you can get to a pretty serious free cash flow for that number. Now that's probably a, a peak cash flow number given that things might slow down a bit after the initial burst of activity. But valuing uh, steady state cash flows at 10x or, or peak cash flows a model of value for the casino between for Butler State between 15 and 18 million, call it that. So moving on to aerospace, uh, again, this is a pretty decent business. It's highly specialized. There are barriers to entry. You can't even perform this work without FAA certifications and, and highly trained technicians. But there is a, a very deeply cyclical aspect to the business and the fixed costs tend to be high. Uh, these technicians don't come cheap and you have to have hangar space and, and things of that nature. So um, Butler's aerospace divisions focus on servicing legacy aircraft. Uh, these are a few of the brands that they, they focus on. And, uh, and as these, uh, these aircraft age, they tend to require more frequent uh, inspections and upgrades. And, and the FAA is always adding on additional requirements for navigation and, and safety uh, aspects. And so uh, there's a large market for this and it should continue to grow over time. Uh, as people continue want to want to keep their aircraft uh, airworthy. And like I said, they also do some defense work for Apache helicopter uh, weapon systems. So again, historical results, uh, quite a bit different than, than the casino, obviously. We do see growth over time, but they do tend to have good years followed by bad years in, in a relatively unpredictable fashion, unfortunately. But we do notice one thing, and that's when revenue can be maintained above around 16 million, they tend to make money. And that profit goes up pretty dramatically in years when they can generate a lot more than 16 million in profit or in revenue. And so there is a fairly substantial operating leverage in the business. But lately, more than often, they've been very successful in, in managing revenue to, to a high rate. And the backlog continues to be strong. Uh, at 17.2 million. Uh, it peaked at around 20 million in fiscal 2020, but obviously is down a little bit with the impact of COVID. But I think the, the future is pretty bright here. They've invested a lot in uh, getting FAA certifications to perform certain upgrades and modifications. Uh, 2020 was obviously a blowout year for them. And they really benefited from a particular update and upgrade that was mandated by the FAA for uh, GPS systems and tracking. Uh, we likely won't have something like that again for a few more years. And so I kind of consider 2019 to be a more normalized figure. Uh, and the backlog is actually higher now than it was in, in 2019. And so I, I would expect uh, pre-tax income to be closer to the 2019 figure than 2020 going forward. Um, it's always possible that we get into a bit of a, the doldrums and, and revenue dips back into the high teens and we operate at near break even for a while, but I think it's much more likely that growth continues going forward. Uh, again, long term performance drivers, uh, aircraft continue to require more and, and more complicated and sophisticated and expensive equipment to, to comply with FAA regulations. Uh, classic aircraft get older and older. Uh, and they require more frequent work. And there's just not that many places you can have these, these services performed. Uh, and there's not that many trained, skilled technicians out there, uh, which limits competition, but again, contributes to the high operating leverage and the high fixed costs that Butler uh, has, to, has to contend with, given the, uh, the, the compensation that the technicians uh, receive. So what is aerospace actually worth? Uh, it, it really has an average year, which makes things about a little bit difficult to, uh, to predict. But I base my estimates here off of the 2019 figure, excluding the blowout year they had in 2020. Uh, I think they're capable, and, and I think this is conservative, but I think they can generate a revenue growth of at least 3% in the long run. And it was 4.4 from 2011 to 2019. I think operating margin can, can center around 10%. And just plugging that, a pretty simple growth model here could give you a value somewhere right around 30 million for the segment. And, uh, but I, I use a range for that valuation on, uh, coming up to take a look at what the company's worth. 
Uh, and here we get to some of the parts, which is probably my least favorite kind of evaluation and analysis, but it kind of makes sense here for a, a business that has two radically different segments. I think that going with uh, both uh, pessimistic, base, and optimistic ranges for the casino and aerospace, as well as what you call uh, net corporate cash that's not operating, I think you get to evaluation anywhere between 76 cents and 98 cents a share conservatively, centering around uh, 87 cents. So I think there's pretty good upside. I think it's worth at least 20 percent more than the current trading price up to as much as 60% higher. Uh, and also you don't see corporate level costs here because those are already incorporated in the results that they report from their, from their segments. There's no additional overhead not reflected in the segment results. All right, no analysis would be complete without an assessment of management. And unfortunately, it's not the most wonderful in the world. Uh, the CEO is 81 years old. Uh, his son is also involved in the business, not as, an, uh, not as a CEO or CFO or anything, but he is a VP, and I imagine he could someday become CEO. But the career path of 81-year-old CEOs is typically a matter of a few years, not a few decades. And they like to get paid. They pay themselves about $3 million a year, which is very much excessive for a business of this size. And that's probably one thing that holds the valuation of the company back a little bit. And yet they still manage to make a lot of money for the company, even at that level of compensation, but obviously that's too much. Uh, they do own a good bit of the company at 22%. However, uh, the value of their stock holdings at around, oh, I think it's around 12 million is not a great ratio compared to how much they bring home every year. I wish they owned more stock and got paid a bit less. So I don't think management is dishonest or incapable or inept. But they are a bit complacent and, and they don't seem to know exactly what to do to drive value here. Uh, the company has a stock repurchase plan that they do buy back some shares, not enough. They need to be far more aggressive. I'd love to see a tender offer. And historically, they've tended to offset these repurchases by granting shares to insiders. The good news is they've run out of shares to grant. There's no more shares approved to, to grant. And so that won't be happening anymore. They've also talked for years about selling the casino or spinning it off. They make noise about this. They say it's in progress, but nothing actually happens, at least at this point. They did purchase the casino this year, like I said, which is a great move. They talked about that for years before they actually got it done. And so great move, but shareholders need more. Uh, the good news is there could be potential for activism here. Uh, a couple of funds have purchased reasonable size stakes in Butler over the past couple of years. Veritas, which uh, I know very little about, they're fairly new owns 9.2% of the company. They filed a 13G uh, passive stake last year uh, and they upped their stake uh, over the last six months. Zeph Capital, I'm more familiar with, uh, really great track record, does engage in activism now and then. And, and they are up to an 8.6% stake uh, from 8.6% from a year earlier. So I think it could be just a matter of time before uh, small cap, micro cap focused, uh, active managers own more of the company than management does. And I wouldn't be surprised to see them lean on the company at that point, uh, or try to enlist other shareholders to, to create some, some positive uh, reforms and corporate governance and maybe even push for a sale of the company. So yeah, again, thanks for listening. This is uh, again, Butler National Corporation. It's profitable, strong balance sheet, decent quality operations. Uh, some positive catalysts on the on the future for especially for the casino, but also for aerospace uh, and management. Uh, again, not the best, honest, uh, hardworking, but not really in a position to maximize value. But activists are knocking on the door, and I think we could see something happen uh, in the short term there. So let's see. That about does it for me. Uh, I'll open up the floor for some questions at this point. Okay, great. Uh, I'll kick one off uh, if I can, Dave. I mean, yeah. just going back to the management one, I mean, as you say, they're two radically different divisions, but, uh, you know, hard to see a growth path with the casino business. Have they got a growth strategy for the aerospace business? You know, have they made noises about acquisitions or, you know, opening a, a hangar in another part of the country or anything like that? Or is literally their growth strategy for the airspace business, you know, hoping for a bit of extra volume and, and trying to put through a, you know, a small inflation plus price increase every year. 
Yeah, uh, the strategy for them to, to grow and develop aerospace is mostly by improving their capability to do new services and, and offer new products and new kinds of upgrades. So every year they invest in something called F FAA supplemental certificates, which is essentially they put their technicians through training, uh, invest money, and at the end they get an FAA certificate that says this company is now legally allowed to offer this particular sort of service or upgrade or, or can perform this, pro this procedure on this aircraft. And they've been investing a uh, a uh, couple million dollars a year so they can offer more additional services. Also, this last year they were they were prevented because uh, a lot of their business is international. They get a lot of people who fly their aircraft in from Canada or Mexico or even Europe or Japan to get this work done. Uh, but they were kind of really not able to do that this year, but they want to do more of that going forward. But I don't really see acquisitions as likely. I don't really see new locations as likely. They have plenty of capacity at their existing places, but they absolutely will invest a lot in trying to increase the, uh, the, the breadth and availability of, of, the, of the types of service they can offer. And they've done a good job at that. And that's one reason revenues have roughly doubled over the last uh, uh, most of a decade. Uh, question then from the audience, um, and maybe you can expand on it. Uh, you know, the question is, do you think the company will be broken up or you know, what would you see as some of the likely scenarios from the activists? Is it more uh, uh, just a complete change of management in a new board or do you think they want to you know, sell one or both of the, the businesses and just try and uh, clean up a... Uh, uh, what should I say, an unconventional holding company structure? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think a couple things. I think the activist number one goal would probably be a return of capital. I mean, they're sitting on 25% of their market cap in, in non-operating cash, which they really don't need. And so a tender offer or, or a special dividend of some sort would, would be a great thing. Uh, probably a, a gently encouraging a, a leadership transition. Uh, I imagine that the CEO likes his job, but he, he's 81. He can't do it forever. And so I think there could be some savings there as, they, as he transitions into retirement, maybe cutting that management compensation down to a more reasonable level uh, would be wildly beneficial for profits. And then I do think they would continue to push for the sale uh, of the casino. Uh, it, it's a, it's a non-growth asset. It's, it's obviously just a distraction for management. It doesn't take a lot of their time, but there's no, absolutely no reason for, and the market doesn't like to see a, a combination casino and aerospace services company. It makes no sense. And, and so that's the, the smaller, less valuable uh, part of the corporations of spinning it or selling it would be the, the logical move. But there's a number of levers they could pull here and uh, any one of them could create a lot of value for the shareholders. And so I, I don't think they'd pursue just one or the other. I think they'd pursue it all. And then on the aerospace business, another question, I'm assuming there would be some kind of natural buyers for the business. Have they ever muted that, you know, they've had offers from larger players or maybe um, competitors to, you know, take out that business? Not that I know of, I wouldn't be surprised they haven't disclosed anything, but, but I get the idea that, I mean, it's Kansas. It's a very, very sleepy uh, part of the country. Uh, it, they're, they're called the flyover states for a reason, and not that they're not lovely places, but they don't get a lot of attention from investors or, or private or public. And, and so I think Butler has just gone under the radar for a very, very long time. Uh, I think the managers generally they, they enjoy the business. They, I think they like running it. I don't think they're interested in selling and that's probably why they have it. And they've done a decent job operationally. It's just that the, the corporate costs are too high and they've been too reluctant to share the wealth with shareholders. And so I don't think it's likely that we'll see a sale or a merger or any kind for the aerospace business, but it's, it's not impossible either. Uh, like I said, there is sort of a generational transfer of power coming up in the next couple of years. And, uh, I've not talked to the son who will likely become the CEO, but I, I, I would have to imagine he's a little bit less set in his ways than his 81-year-old uh, father. And the, the kind of post-COVID noises, um, 
you know, have they given kind of any uh, guidance to the market uh, of, because the US is obviously very far advanced in its, you know, vaccine rollout. Are they, are they really seeing a big uh, push on that? Um, was it that order book? Do you know, do, do they think it, there's, there, there's more to even come in the second half of, of 2021, maybe if I can say that? Sure. Uh, they do a quarterly investment call or investor call, and, and they do provide some commentary on the outlook for aerospace and the casino. They say they've had a lot of interest. In fact, they've been close to capacity as far as how much work they, they can even do. And that's a limiting factor for them is how many technicians can they find and, and employ to do this work. Uh, sometimes it can take six months or a year to get the work done on your aircraft because they're just waiting for uh, worker availability. But yeah, they, they said that they, they think things look pretty strong in the aerospace. They've had a lot of luck, a lot of good conversations with uh, potential uh, customers. So they, they're feeling good about that. And, and they're also pretty excited about the casino as, uh, like I said, they're hitting revenue records uh, beginning in March. And that's just going to continue as people are, have been stuck at home for a year and are just looking for anything, especially in Dodge City, which is a small city without a whole lot of uh, entertainment alternatives uh, and the nearest other casino is 100 miles away and so most people will go there so yeah they, they do sound optimistic uh, uh, like I said there could be a bit of a, a boom that is maybe uh, fleeting uh, before they head back to more normalized conditions but they seem very optimistic for both businesses uh, for this year as things reopen okay great and if we don't have any more, let me just double check here. If we don't have any more questions from Dave, I know, let me just double check. I think Trevor is waiting in the wings for us. He is. Uh, Dave, thank you very much for the presentation and taking the time out to join us today.